I start, my, my name is Eric, as I said earlier. <clears throat> I started uh, working on this field of equality four years ago, five years ago actually, when I joined the Kenya Human Rights Commission as an associate in charge of LGBT. Um, we did an intensive research across the country uh, focusing on what was the lived experience of LGBT persons in Kenya and how societal norms and the laws affected their lived realities. And um, we found out that um, besides having uh, repressive laws, there was a very, very close link to how those laws came to be and how society was being shaped in, in terms of public policy and attitudes by the same law and how religion um, and law intersected in a very interesting way to repress people's um, rights to express their sexual orientations that are different. Um, so, after that, I joined Hayas, and that's why I met your colleague, Duncan Breed. Hayas, I Hayas guess, is upstairs. upstairs. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's interesting that the first time I came to New York, I came to this building. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my former employers. And so, I was in charge of LGBT um, refugee uh, program from East Africa, where we were doing almost the same thing that Human Rights First is doing representing LGBT refugees who had fled from different African countries and found themselves in Nairobi or Kampala. And we would uh, process them for asylum applications to the US government through the State Department. Um, that's when I met Duncan, a very, very resourceful gentleman. Please pass my regards to him. Now, um, this year, Kenya turns 50. I don't know whether Kenya actually turns 50, because I think Kenya's been there for a long time. <laughs> but Kenya is celebrating 50 years of independence from the British rule. Um, it reminds me of the history that we have been uncovering through, through our work in the last five years uh, on the effect of colonization and the missionary work to our country and to the work that we do with LGBT persons. Because in the 18th century, when the British landed on the shores of Kenya, um, we also had the Portuguese and the Arabs. But what came with the British rule was colonization and the advent of missionary war, Christianity. Uh, our land was taken, our culture was erased, what was norm was considered abnormal, what was our spirituality was considered evil and we were taught about this Messiah, this Savior. I am a Christian by the way, don't think I am hating on Christianity. <laughs> but it's interesting that today I look back and I see very many parallels between what people are fighting for during the independence struggle, the Mau Mau struggle, and what we are fighting for. Because in essence, the black person 50 years plus ago in Kenya, was treated lesser because of the color of his skin. A very innate characteristic that he couldn't change about himself. And because of that, his identity as human, his dignity, and his sense of worth was taken away from him. Today, uh, Barack Obama came to Senegal last year and he spoke about this racism that used to be there and compared it the homophobia that is happening in the continent now because people are being denied their right to exist as full humans, to express their orientation, to thrive in a society of equals because of their sexual orientation, a characteristic that is so innate that cannot be changed at all. One of the effects of this British rule um, was a colonial law through the penal code we adopted the Penal Code of India. In law school, we call it the Penal Code of 1897. When we got independence, that's what we copy-pasted to, uh, to the laws of Kenya. And in the Penal Code, section 162 to 165 have what we call sodomy laws in Kenya. Canon knowledge against the order of nature, that's the wording of the law, is punishable with 14 years imprisonment. Indecent acts between adults, especially males, whether in private or public, in section 165, is punishable with five years imprisonment. 
What is kind of knowledge against the order of nature? Uh, we found this definition from the Commonwealth case of Banana versus Republic in Zimbabwe, where it was defined as penetration per annum. So in essence, it's just the gay men or persons who have anal sex who are criminalized. Women are not essentially criminalized. They are collateral damage to these laws. They, women, lesbian women have, um, and, and, and I'll get to this later as, 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 as from our research, they have a collateral effect because of masculinity and the heterosexual power and privileges that exist in society. But what these laws have done is that they reduce gay men into one-dimensional creatures. That every time we speak about the rights of LG LGBT persons, the thing that rushes to most people's mind is a sexual act, the imagination of what two men do in the privacy of the bedrooms and how that is gross and immoral. Um, but in terms of direct effects of these sodomy laws, uh, we've had police harassment where we have documented a lot of cases where the police are involved with cartels, with other blackmailers to extort money from gay <coughs> men uh, with threats of arrests where, uh, because of the lack of social space to meet and socialize and develop relationships. People are very, very much active online because of the technological age. And when people meet online and have physical meetings in the privacy of their houses, um, especially the closeted people, we've had reports of rape, we've had reports of persons being abducted and money being extorted from them through um, their cell phones being taken and their families being called so they can send money uh, being told that their family member has been arrested or caught defiling a child or such other ridiculous uh, stories that are made up so that fear can be heightened for money to be extorted from people and the police are involved in this but we've been working very closely with the committee of administrative justice in Kenya to report all the police officers who are involved and to have all these cases documented in police stations in jurisdictions where they happen across the country. We have six cases in court um, at the magistrate's level, criminal cases. The charges are very similar in decent acts between adults. Uh, the reason why the, the police are no longer using sodomy laws to prosecute and charge people is that it is quite difficult to prove sodomy. You have to prove penetration, you have to get medical examination reports uh, where uh, from resort, resorting from anal swaps and so because the threshold of proving the burden of proof is too high for sodomy laws they prefer to use indecent um, charges so the charges are framed as indecent acts between adults where a neighbor of a herd um, moans and noises in the neighborhood and it sounded as if it was two men getting it on and then they call the, the, the other neighbors and they go and perhaps break down the door and they find two men in bed and that is gross. So most of the witnesses are actually here, so in, in, in my opinion as a lawyer, this is purely using the criminal justice system to harass people because of their sexual orientation. Besides that, we have um, cases of denial of services. Last year, there was this gentleman who went to a dispensary in Diani to get treated for inner watts, and the attending nurse uh, was absolutely shocked because of the nature of the infection that she went and called other patients who were waiting in line to be treated and other nurses in the facility to come and see a homosexual who's, who's been engaging in anal sex. Um, in essence, because of these laws, people are very much afraid to go seek health services when they are sick. Um, you, you'll find that people will seek health services as a matter of last resort when they have nothing else to do when they feel that this is taking them down absolutely and completely. Um, housing, people are being kicked out of their houses because of their sexual orientation. When the landlord finds out that you're queer and you're told you can't live here anymore. We have documented all these cases. They are in the Kenya Human Rights Commission uh, report 
called the Outlawed Amongst Us, as well as in the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights uh, Report on Reproductive and Sexual Health Rights in Kenya 2012. Denial of services, registration of NGOs, the organization that I work for, the National Gay Lesbian Human Rights Commission, has been denied registration by the government of Kenya. Um, they, we have been trying to register the National Gay Lesbian Human Rights Commission for the last one and a half years, since April 2012. And uh, in May this year, the government sent us a very, very distasteful letter um, saying that they would not register any gay or lesbian associations in Kenya because of one, criminal laws forbid same-sex intimacy, two, the constitution of Kenya does not explicitly mention sexual orientation as a ground that is protected from discrimination, three, uh, the NGO Coordination Act of 1992 authorizes the director of the NGO board to refuse to register any organization which in his opinion has uh, activities which are against the national interest and whose words or the words or the names of that NGO are repugnant and undesirable. So they told us that our names were undesirable and repugnant and that our work was not in the national interest of our republic. We have since sued the government. We have a constitution petition pending in court, uh, uh, at the High Court, which will be heard uh, on the 30th of this month regarding the interpretation of the freedom of association under the Constitution of Kenya 2010 to question whether it is inclusive of gay and lesbian associations because the Constitution of Kenya speaks about every person has a right to join and form associations of any kind. So every person and associations of any kind uh, we would want um, a judicial interpretation of whether those words include or exclude gay and lesbian associations. Uh, there are cases of murder. Um, two months ago, the National AIDS Control Council released a report, um, a study of MSM health in Kenya, and they had this quantitative data on where most of their respondents were from. And they listed Mombasa, the city of Mombasa in the coastal area, as being number two in terms of the numbers of MSM uh, per region. And what happened is that the local radio stations picked it up and they started inciting people to cleanse their city from these immoral acts. And there's been this vigilante from some mosques. It's a group of youth drawn from different mosques in Mombasa. Their main drive is to cleanse Mombasa from homosexuals, especially the effeminate gay men who sell sex on the coastal region. So, what happened is that two men were attacked, same style, same venue, same week, and they were cut on the head. Um, one of them died um, from beheading, and then the other person is still recuperating in hospital. Uh, in 2010, the same city, Mtwapa, in the Mtwapa region, most of you are aware of this, there, are case, there was a case where three, four gay men were dosed with kerosene by a mob incited by the local sheikh and the Mombasa bishop, Bishop Chai. Um, and they were do, the, the, the gay men were dosed with kerosene so that they can be set ablaze for allegedly trying to have a gay wedding. The police moved in and saved their lives and they had to relocate internally. The gay man. But these are some of the few cases that, that, that come to, to um, our records. There are also cases where people are not able to thrive in their own country and because of all this persecution they seek asylum uh, in other countries. Most of them flee to Europe or to the Americas. The indirect effect is that we are considered to be second-class citizens. We, we walk around feeling the weight of criminalization, knowing that you are a criminal. You have conversations with your family. If you have to come out, like when I was coming out to my family as gay, um, we had the conversation of why I was encouraging people to keep doing illegal activities in my country. Why I was encouraging people and protecting persons who the good Lord condemns. But is it as 
dark and nasty as I painted? Of course it's not. How do we thrive? The grey areas. In 2010, uh, we came together after having a very, very good civil war in 2007, 2008, which we called the post-election violence, where we killed each other and burned churches and torched homes and had people relocated. And now we have our president and deputy president facing charges of um, crimes against humanity for this violence at the ICC, ongoing as we speak today. Um, what this election violence did is that it shocked our conscience as a country. It showed us how low we could descend and lose our sense of humanity and kill and murder women and children and brother against brother just because of our ethnic differences. Differences are innate, differences are not chosen and differences that had no harm at all to our moral fabric, to our economy, uh, to our whatever socio-economic framework of our country. And so we came together and after 20 years of struggling to come up with a constitution, of writing a constitution through universal suffrage not working, we came together, came together with a committee of experts and wrote a very brilliant poetic document called the Constitution of Kenya 2010. Allow me to take you through it because it's the, I think it's one of the reasons that we have held together as a country and one of the reasons that a lot of LGBT organizations have flourished. It's one of the reasons that civil society has flourished in our country for a long time. It is the informative of the gray areas where we maneuver uh, in the context of criminalization. In the preamble of this constitution, it speaks about it recognizes our diversity, our ethnic diversity, our religious diversity, and whatever diversities we have as a country. It commits, or we commit, as, um, as, as, as we say, because it's, it says we the people, just as in your constitution, Americans. It says that we the people commit to a government that is based on human rights, on equality, on freedom, on democracy, on social justice, on the rule of law. In Article 8 of this Constitution, we speak about, it, it, it says that there shall be no state religion. In essence, Christianity and Islam cannot be used to interpret laws, to inform policies, to inform lawmaking. In Article 10, the Constitution binds all state officers and private citizens with national values of human dignity, of equity, of social justice, of inclusiveness of equality and human rights, of non-discrimination and protection of marginalized groups. The same constitution defines marginalized groups as groups who, before the constitution was enacted, because of the laws and practices that were there, they were placed at a disadvantage. And I would very much argue that LGBT persons in my country belong to these marginalized groups. And part of our national values is to protect these marginalized groups and communities, be they ethnic or, or sexual and gender minorities. The Bill of Rights is very extensive and very purposive. It promotes social justice and says that it exists to promote the realization of the potential of all human beings. Yes, um, no, not yesterday, the day before yesterday, on Tuesday, when we were at the International Bar Association, I was having this conversation with Jessica Stern, and she was asking me, why do I do what I do? And I told her, I actually never thought about it. And, 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 and I took a minute to think over the sandwich that we were having, and I told her, it makes me very angry, very, very angry, to know that People like I, my, 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 my brothers, my sisters, a lot of people in my country will not achieve their full potential because of just very, very tiny part of their humanity, which is also very, very integral to their humanity, their sexual orientation. When you grow up in a society that shames you, that insults you, that tells you you don't belong to the universe of equals, that injures your dignity from childhood, that has structures that are very, very strong in church. You're told that you don't belong because 
the Christian Bible, how it's interpreted. And I, I'm, I'm very, very, very pleased that Pastor Tolton is helping with a theology that is affirming of sexual diversity. When you go to school, we pay taxes for a compulsory primary education that has in its curriculum, in social education and ethics, um, content that says that homosexuals are social deviants on the same class with drug addicts and the same class with prostitutes, the same class with robbers and criminals. We pay for an education that has Christian religious education. Last year, KCP, KCSE, the Kenya Certificate of Secondary Education, Paper 2 of CRE had this question in number 7. Give 10 reasons why Christians in Kenya are united against homosexuals. You know, we pay for a system that perpetually shames, excludes, and tells you that you don't belong, that injures your dignity. And how do you thrive and compete in a universe of equals with persons who do not have the same injuries internally that you do? So, our constitution seeks to remedy this, to preserve the dignity of individuals and communities, to realize social justice, to remedy this through equity, to help people achieve their full potential. Two months, not actually two months ago, um, on September 8th, one of my close friends, uh, David Ohingo, succumbed to HIV-related complications. Um, David was someone who would have been a brilliant musician, but all he did was train people from his, his, from his house um, and, and, and seeing in birthday parties and bars and social events that are not very public because he was gay, closeted, and he was very much afraid what would happen to his family and to his career should his sexual orientation be found out. I see potential that is being wasted. I see lives that are being injured, dignity that is being robbed of people, and this annoys me because I have lived through it and I've walked that path. And I believe the reason that I went to law school was so that I can be part of the healing for my country, for people who are like I. Anyway, moving on and speaking about this constitution. In Article 20, it tells courts to interpret the constitution in a way that most favors the enforcement of fundamental rights and freedoms. So courts are bound not to go back and use morality, not to try and restrict freedoms, but to enhance uh, the enjoyment of these freedoms. In Article 20, the same Article 20, it binds the courts to pr when interpreting the Constitution, when questions are brought before the court, constitutional questions are brought before the court, to interpret it and promote values that underlie an open and democratic society based on human dignity, equality, equity and freedom. And these are words I'll keep repeating because the Constitution keeps repeating those wo these words, human dignity, equality, equity and freedom. Asking the courts to follow what open and democratic societies do. Asking the courts to get jurisprudence from the free world. Asking the courts not to be guided by a morality that seeks to enforce repression, but a constitutional morality of equality, of recognizing dignity and valuing it, placing the human first as the human rights first uh, organization does. Um, 22 allows public interest litigation, which we, I will speak about later as we've been engaging on. 20, Article 23 tells the High Court that it has mandate and powers to invalidate any law that denies, violates, infringes, or threatens a right. Sodomy laws, in my opinion, threaten so many rights. They violate so many rights. They infringe a lot of rights. Privacy, dignity, equality. This has been very well nuanced at the, at the, at the international level and also at domestic courts such as in Uganda in the case of Victor Oyo Mukasa and Jacqueline Kasha. Um, Article 24 draws the test on when and how human rights can be limited. And it, tell, it says that limitations must be justifiable and reasonable, guided by values that underlie an open democratic society, 
again it speaks about equality freedom and equity there's no mention of morality or religion in the limitation of these rights none at all um, article 27 is the anchor of the bill of rights equality it says that every person is equal before the law and every person has a right to equal protection and equal benefit of the law. The penal code does not guarantee people like I, LGBT persons, homosexuals, the equal protection or equal benefit of the law. The constitution in Article 45 only allows marriage between the, op the opposite sex, consenting adults of the opposite sex. In my opinion, ladies and gentlemen, that's not equal benefit of the law. The Marriage Act 2013, it's actually a bill, it's not an act yet, it's being considered by parliament and we've written to protest against it. Only allows marriage between the opposite sex and punishes anyone who purports to engage or conduct a marriage or even witness or promises a marriage that is not allowed by the bill with five years imprisonment. It's an indirect way of targeting anyone who purports to promise like if you're a female and you promise another female that you marry her and they are witnesses it doesn't matter whether you're drunk or you're in love or whatever that's a crime should that law pass equal protection equal benefit of the law equality means full and equal enjoyment of all rights says this, this same constitution article 27 sub article 4 says the state shall not directly or indirectly discriminate on anyone on any ground whatsoever including the ground of sex the ground of sexual orientation is not mentioned. But this constitution in Article 2, sub Article 6 and 8 says that any treaty that Kenya has ratified shall form part of Kenyan law. Kenya has ratified the ICCPR. The ICCPR has been interpreted, Article 26 of the ICCPR has been interpreted by the UN Human Rights Committee to say that the ground of sex is analogous to the ground of sexual orientation. So to be very interesting, when these questions appear before the constitution bench of Kenya, to find out whether this analogy will actually be drawn, because we are bound by these laws that we ratify, the same way we are bound by the Rome Statute. That's why our president and deputy president are facing charges at the International Criminal Court. Um, I would like to say that we have a very open-ended list on the grounds of um, constitutional protection. Article 43 speaks about the highest obtainable standard of health, including reproductive health care. And this is where the government quasi-judicial commission, the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights, this, is, this has been the entry point of LGBT organizing in Kenya for such a long time. The right to health. It started in 2007 when the National AIDS Control Council started incorporating the MSM element in HIV prevention and care programming. And what, what, what started as pure scientific research on establishing linkages between MSM health uh, regarding HIV and HIV in the general population became a window to start conversations on not just the right to health but also the right to dignity, the right to equality, um, respect for human rights. It, it became an entry point to start organizing for LGBT groups. And what has been very encouraging is that since 2007 to the present, the National AIDS Control Council releases a report on HIV status in Kenya and what they have done. It tells its own government which, which funds it. And in the recommendation bet, it always recommends every year to, to remove structural barriers to access HIV care and treatment for MSM through the decriminalization of homosexual sex. I have 30 minutes, thank you very much. Three, Three minutes. <laughs> and I hate to cut you off, I'm sorry. But... Right. But what's our roadmap to achieving equality in this context? It started a long time ago. Um, not, not quite a long time ago, but in um, the Commonwealth, the case of Kanane versus uh, Republic in Botswana, when the court said that 
there was no constitutive body of evidence to show that LGBT persons deserved protection in the constitution was repeated in Kenya in 2010 in the case of Richard Marcia versus Republic, an intersex person who was suing the AG for refusal of recognition. And um, the High Court repeated the same thing, that there was need to collect evidence showing that there was a constitutive body of LGBT persons who are deserving of constitutional protection. And so what we've been doing since then is not only collecting evidence through national commissions, but also through judicial elements, such as strategic litigation. Our roadmap is actually informed by incremental litigation, where uh, other than this case of 2010, in 2013, there is a trans woman. She's a farmer from Thika who was arrested by the police and they stripped her and they groped her with her breast to ascertain whether she was actually biologically female because uh, she was actually arrested for assaulting another woman. And this other woman was saying, the way she assaulted me, no woman would ever assault another woman like that. And then she also had facial hair. So they, they, they undressed her in public and got cameras uh, from the local media to embarrass her and show that she was actually a man dressed like a woman because that was their understanding. And in 2013, this year, the High Court agreed that her rights to dignity and privacy were violated and they slapped the Kenya Police Service with 200,000 Kenya shillings in, in, um, in um, damages. 2013, same, same year, uh, in terms of collecting judicial evidence of violations, Audrey Mbugwa versus the Kenya National Examination Council. Audrey Mbugwa is a trans woman who has been refused a uh, change of names and gender marker in her high school certificates by the Kenya National Examination Council. She's since sued the government and the case is pending before the Judicial Review Division of the High Court. September this year, Eric Gitari versus the Attorney General. Um, this is regarding the freedom of association, the refusal of the government to register gay and lesbian NGOs. Ladies and gentlemen, what we are doing is incremental litigation, a step at a time, a foot on the door approach. Keep the door open, let the cases keep coming in, let the judiciary be the element that collects all this evidence so that incrementally, we are able to pile enough jurisprudence that we are going to use to strike down sodomy laws in three or four years. We have a roadmap. Um, there are more cases that we are preparing for uh, the judiciary, but I shall not delve into that. Um, I will quickly run through the supporting structures that we are using to make sure that our litigation efforts are successful because we can win cases in court, but we also need to win cases in the court of public opinion. When we strike down sodomy laws, we need to have a society that is ready to allow homosexuals and lesbians to enjoy these rights that are realized through litigation. So we have a litigation collective with uh, many seven plus civil society stakeholders uh, drawn from government and um, state, state uh, semi-autonomous um, agencies, as well as civil society organizations from the women's rights, children, LGBT, and sex worker movement. Uh, we engage in civic action, our Occupy Parliament. Uh, when we got our MPs voted in, uh, in the general election this year, uh, the first order of business by the members of parliament was to increase their salaries without even having passed any bill. And um, they actually paid higher than your senators in the US. Mm -hmm. So um, we were protesting against this and we had three, four demonstrations. And in the last demonstrations, we took pigs into parliament to show them that they were greedy as those pigs. And, and we got arrested and we are still pursuing these criminal cases in court. We are trying to draw analogy from the South Africa experience where LGBT persons are very much involved in the ANC struggle against apartheid. And so when the ANC got independence, um, they, it was very easy to negotiate for sexual orientation to be included against um, discrimination in the constitution of South Africa. We, have, we are developing media campaigns with the help of Bla Advertising and Pastor Tolton here. Uh, we are engaging in public dialogue. La we started last year. It has been ongoing, but last year we had the Gay and Lesbian Awards at City Hall, Nairobi, uh, open to the public, to the media, with police protection. Idaho Bit, this year, in May 17th, public dialogue, City Hall again. 
Engaging religion through the United Coalition of Affirming Africans, again very much helped by the Black Church of America, drawing analogy between slavery and what's happening right now because we feel that um, it's brother turning against brother. The same thing that happened a long time ago. Brother was turned against brother and it was not a good experience. And the same documents that are being used, the same Bible is still being used today. And um, engaging culture with traditional elders. But our challenges are many. We have cultural wars from the Americas, the American right-wing conservative churches, Pat Robinson, Pat Robertson is funding the East Africa Center for Law and Justice through the American Center for Law and Justice. Uh, they are always interested parties in every case we file in court. And they file all these affidavits and they copy paste the book of Genesis and Leviticus all the time. Religious age red, which is uh, passing on through because we don't have a hate, hate crimes legislation. So you can stand up with your Bible and say that you can as well kill and maim homosexuals and you'll not be arrested at all. And um, we have Project C. I don't know who runs Project C, but it's a website that is hosted in the US and they have photos of activists working on LGBT and reproductive health. And they have their photos online and they quote these scriptures saying that whoever supports this should be stoned to death and the blood shall be upon their hands. So there's a lot of cultural wars going on. There's a lot of hatred. Most of this hatred, ladies and gentlemen, is not coming from Africa. It is being fueled by our brothers and sisters in the US using the same, same, same Bible that they used to turn brother against brother years ago. Uh, I will close by saying this. Uh, one of the things that have been very helpful to, to us is drawing from anthropological and historical um, texts and readings of African sexuality and spirituality. When I was coming out to my grandmother, who's never been to a classroom, she, she laughed very much about my sexual orientation. She laughed for a long time. And then she said, I know you, because she knows me from her, her past, where uh, she, she says on, when she was growing up and she was, and she was very ill, they, they, they had this very, very famous medicine man called the Mugawe among the Meru of Kenya next to this mountain here. Um, and the Mugai was a very, very respected religious leader. And the Mugai, she says, was a homosexual. He used to, he was a man who was sexually and romantically involved with other men. And, 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 and this got me interested to look more into the African spirituality and sexuality. And I found out that it's not just the Mugai of Meru, there's the Oneki of the Kikuyu. You know, uh, I, have, I actually have a list here. Allow me to quickly scan through it. I know I have three minutes. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's the Dagara of the Burkina Faso. The Dagara are believed to be gatekeepers. Um, the Dagara viewed gay men or homosexuals as very, very gifted spiritual beings with a psychic energy that maintained the gates between this universe and the other universe, that maintained the delicate balance between seasons. I know that right now you're going through fall. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, in my opinion, the Dagara are watching the seasonal change. <laughs> we had the Zande in, 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 in Sudan. We had the Mami water. In Nigeria, the mummy watcher was this African goddess who lived under sea and she would take upon her lovers, male and female, yet she was a feminine and an, a, a feminine go goddess. She would take female lovers and male lovers. There was in African traditional spirituality, there were no gender binaries. And what happened with colonization to create nationhood? There had to be order and structures which were copy pasted and culture was erased. And what was standard or what was a known issue such as same sex intimacy, and I'm sure you've heard this from Uganda, which has been repeated by Museveni, that it was a known issue. Yes, we had homosexuals before colonization and missionaries came. It was a known issue. It was not punishable with death or 14 years in, as, as, as it is in Kenya. It was actually if you are homosexual because society was baffled by it, you are respected and thought to have a special purpose 
and a special place in society. So ladies and gentlemen, we are trying to bring this healing to our lands, to our country, and I thank you for this opportunity to speak here. I am sure I have not responded to most of your questions, especially regarding foreign policy, but it will be very interesting to to be guided by activists who are working on the ground, as has been the case in Uganda, uh, so that our international uh, allies do not respond to discrimination issues that are happening in our domestic countries without consulting the foot soldiers on the ground. It is important to underscore to the US government that it is irresponsible to try and tie funding to respect for gay rights because what's happening on the ground is that this funding that we get from foreign aid is used for socio, socio amenities like healthcare and education. And when this is stifled, the people who are blamed are the homosexuals and this increases homophobia in our regions. Um, I guess that's... That's, um, that's beautiful. I'm going to open up for Q&A, but uh, two, two things I'd like to say. Uh, Pastor Joseph Tolton, if, could I ask you to run the Q&A? Because I have to, I have to be in, in, in a Brooklyn court yes. very soon, sure. and I'm, I'm sorry, I, I have to escape. Um, and if you could offer some closing thoughts, we're very grateful for your work with Eric and, and for bringing him to the States and uh, ensuring that his visit is, is a success. Uh, your, your Twitter account, you identify yourself as a poet and a carpenter, so this is a beautiful legal sermon. <laughs> well, and uh, so I'm turning it to you, Pastor Joseph. Uh, I think it's very appropriate. My, my uh, final remark is, is about traditional values. Your country is 50 years old. My country is 22 years old. Uh, having declared independence from itself <laughs> in, in, in 1991. But I see the same hypocrisy among the elites, see the same scapegoating and the same uh, political games that they're playing. And, and in denying the tradition of same-sex relationships, same-sex uh, culture that existed throughout our history. And uh, for them to use the word, to evoke the word tradition is, I think, especially appalling. And for them to run, for the Russian government, let's say, to run with it internationally is, uh, is it's just insulting to intelligence it's, it, at some level. But, uh, and that makes them weaker mm. at the same time. But thank you, and I'm, I'm sorry I have to run, but thank you. I, I turn it over to you. Great. Let me thank you, Kess, for having pulled this all together and for working with us. Thank you. So very much. <laughs> Please, I'm sure you guys have thoughts and questions about Eric's work and where he's taking his organization and how you might be able to stand in solidarity with him and also more tangibly, so please. Yes. Yeah, I'm just actually curious to hear more about your organization, and it sounds like you you work more internationally, not just Kenya, is that right? Or is it just in Kenya? Just in Kenya. Just in Kenya. Do you collaborate with other East African groups? Is there a yes, sort of a network? Yes, we have a network um, of East African actors, drawn from Uganda and Tanzania. Mm -hmm. But these platforms are organized by people like Kuhai, the East African, uh, health and sexual rights initiative. We basically do knowledge transfer and share ideas on activism. Right now we're working on a pan-African uh, effort to go before the African Commission next mm. week, mm. Uh, submitting a resolution on protection from violence against, uh, protection from violence on grounds of actual presumed sexual orientation, gender identity. Mm. So you're submitting a draft resolution with other actors from not just East Africa, but across uh, the African continent. We want to get a regional text that we can be using to move uh, our duty bearers at the domestic level. Will you have anyone at the African Commission next week? Sorry? Will you have anyone at the African Commission meeting next week? Yes. Can you tell me who? I'll be there, so I'd like to know who. From the civil society actors? Yeah. Uh, there's uh, Kenny, 
Amson from A Amsha. Um, I'll talk to you afterwards. Maybe oh. we'll get get some details. All right. Yeah, that's great. Yes. So I guess coming from Uganda, I think I've seen a huge backlash. I was there for three years, so mm -hmm. I've really seen a lot of negative behavior. Um, you know, busting in on meetings of LGBT groups who are kind of coming together for training or to do coalition building or strategies. You know, massive. SWAT team government response to anything related to that. And I wondered if you could tell me a little bit more about the experience in Kenya, whether that has also been your experience, where the government is kind of completely illegally <laughs> cracking down on your groups, or whether it's more subtle. I think you were mentioning that the NGO board can just decide not to grant you NGO status, which is also happening in Uganda. And it was something that even my NGO was concerned about, and we were not doing LGBT or anything really that controversial. So. I wonder, you know, what's the government crackdown like in Kenya? And do you have a little more space than in Uganda? We have more space than Uganda. Um, the, the history of the Kenyan Republic is that the people who are mostly cracked down upon are political dissidents, not um, social or sexual dissidents. So we... For example, Kenya was the country that hosted the um, first African Women Forum in the 80s. So historically, we have been progressive on social issues, but not political issues. And the only crackdown we've had from the government in terms of LGBT was <coughs> this year when we had the International Day Against Homophobia and Biphobia and Transphobia. We wanted, we had a permit to march from Uhuru Park across the city to the AG's chambers to petition for decriminalization with a policy brief. And the police came to where we were gathered in the public park and told us that if we marched, they would arrest us for promoting commission of a felony. The felony is sodomy. So that's, that's the closest we came to any crackdown. The rest is in terms of administrative decisions, like registration of NGOs, change of name for trans persons. But there's no direct police crackdown that is sanctioned by the government itself. And I just want to really lift up the Idaho uh, work. Uh, I, I, was, I had the pleasure of being there during part of the planning. And it was, I, I just thought, extraordinary. Uh, you know, uh, particularly working in the African American gay space, living in, in America, I know what our struggles are trying to just get um, sometimes African Americans out in the street in New York City protesting. So to have done it in Nairobi, I thought was extraordinary. And that really is the work um, of Eric's organization. And so I think that what they're doing in terms of uh, taking their movement public in a new way is really, really extraordinary. Mm -hmm. I wanted to come back to, I'm sorry, could you just tell me your name again? Vicky. No, I'm sorry, Mike. Right, right, yes. Gabor. Ron. Gabor, yes. Yeah. To, to the uh, fact that you're going to be at the meeting of the African Commission, I just wanted to make sure that, that you were satisfied in terms of the answer. Because, do, do you, because you could perhaps be supportive of some of the actors on the ground who are going to be presenting this resolution? I'm, I'm going as part of um, a delegation from the UN Special Procedures on, um, on one, of, one of the working groups. Um, and we will be meeting with civil society for the couple of days before the actual commission mm -hmm. meeting and then we'll be meeting with a number of the commissioners of the African Commission, ones that we ask for meetings with. Um, I'm a little bit hesitant about um, asking for an official meeting on, on this issue mm -hmm. because, it, because of its sensitivity sure. and, uh, you know, as an outsider coming in and, um, you know, talking to them about about these issues I think might, might be um, not the best advocacy strategy, but I'm certainly interested in talking to civil society groups about um, advocacy strategies. Exactly, exactly. that'd be great. Um, great. So if, if I could just get some, mm. uh, some contact information for, for people great. that I should. All right, let me get, a, get your business card. Excellent. Great, excellent. I just want to follow up on that. Yeah. Any other, please? I have a question. Um, the mission of Human Rights First is to challenge America to be a global leader in human rights. So what, in your estimation, is the most important thing that America can be doing right now to be helping you and your organization and 
people in Kenya? America needs to stop exporting the hatred. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you figure that out as human rights first, but that has to be stopped. Mm -hmm. uh, we are doing challenging work on equality on a frontier that has controversy at our own domestic level. And the last thing we need is a spoiled, rich, religious, conservative Americans who come, instigate violence and hatred, and go back to their country and live in freedom. Something needs to be done. We need to figure out how to stop them through whatever means, government or litigation as Scott Lively is um, going through, or through advocacy. Whatever you have to do, that has to be stopped. Uh, but also from a foreign um, international policy, there is need to be consistent. Uh, I liked how Hillary Clinton was um, very outspoken on normalizing uh, the struggle for LGBT equality, mm -hmm. saying how gay people are everywhere. They're in Nairobi, they're in the US, they're in Russia, they're in Kampala. They are lawyers, they're doctors. That, that simplicity in getting the message across mm -hmm. um, needs to be very consistent, especially coming from the Secretary of State and from the President himself. And desisting from mixing, as I said again, foreign funding and LGBT work. That is putting SOGI issues in a silo, which, which is not helpful at all, because it fuels uh, exclusion and hatred. Thank you. Just follow up on that. You said consistency with the Secretary of State. Do you feel like Secretary Kerry hasn't been? He hasn't been very consistent. He hasn't yeah. been very outspoken. That's something we have been worried about. Yeah. I think that's a really important point because of she set the, mm -hmm. the benchmark so high. Right. And uh, he has a tremendous opportunity and doesn't really have to do a lot of work because she's right. created the footprint. <laughs> He's just got to walk in it, and so I do think we need to turn up the pressure yeah. a bit on him in that regard. Yeah, it would also be helpful, like uh, when Clinton was visiting Uganda, how she would meet with um, civil society actors, government and judicial officers and politicians, but also make sure that she meets with LGBT activists. Mm -hmm. That sense of respect is really, really good for well, not just the psyche of the, of the activists, but also the message that it sends across to the country, to policymakers, and to the citizens. It is very, very important. Any other thoughts or questions? Um, when you said that you also wanted to win like the court of public opinion, and then you were also talking about African spirituality, and um, uh, yeah, so how much do you think that incorporating and focusing on African spirituality might help like dispel some of the um, negative uh, lessons that have been taught from Christianity and uh, about homosexuality when you're also running the court of public opinion? Do you think that would be helpful at all to incorporate you know, like in, our, like in our spirituality, you used to have this person who we respected a lot, who's homosexual, um, and sort of like incorporate that in your campaign to win over the court of public opinion. Do you think that would be helpful? Instead of, you know, like not just focusing on um, what the Secretary of State also says, mm -hmm. but then also like this is what we have at home, mm -hmm. and it's been a part of our culture and we've grown up with mm -hmm. it. Um, and so we should like, heed that as well. Right. So, yeah. What do you think about that? I totally agree. It has to be a very multi-tire approach. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the two main reasons are given by most uh, persons who are against the rights for LGBT persons is that uh, it's an African and it's ungodly. Uh, getting information especially about African spirituality that defeats those two arguments. It's an African, really? Years ago, before 
Africa was actually called Africa. We are homosexuals in Africa. Uh, it's ungodly. We used to, our gods used to use homosexuals as vessels to speak to our ancestors. How dare you insult our gods? Yeah, so having that message across and having parallel structures and messages coming from allies like um, the Foreign Secretary of the US, such many approaches in terms of helping public opinions would be very helpful. But the African spirituality is, in my opinion, one of the most interesting but also challenging aspect because the elite, the educated persons, are the gatekeepers. They're the ones who keep denying all this. I don't know whether it's because of the effect of Christianity, how Christianity took them to school, gave them privilege, power, and access to patriarchal resources, changing that status quo by going back to the traditional roots of where we came from as sexual beings in our context as a continent is a very, very taskful challenge when we involve the elites in it.